And also with you. Lift up your knocking. Uh, folks, welcome to this town hall here at Sweeney First United Methodist Church on this lovely evening of September the 27th, where we're going to be having, or we're going to be hearing from Reverend Jonathan Bynum about why the GMC. Uh, he's been a part of that process. He's someone that very much believes in that denomination and in that cause. Uh, so he's going to come up here in a moment, and uh, I'm going to give him uh, the floor and the mic. And uh, as well, while he's doing that, you're going to see me and our wonderful youth pastor, Bridget, coming around with uh, some note cards. So what's going to happen is uh, Jonathan's going to be speaking, and uh, if you have a question, um, I'm going to hand you a note card. And you're going to write down that question on that note card, and then you're going to flag me or Bridget uh, back down, and we'll pick up the note card, and then we will uh, kind of feed... Um, the questions to Reverend Bynum uh, at the end of his talk. I do ask that uh, if you have a question and uh, want to write something down, that it is a question with a real question mark at the end. It's not a <laughs> um, you know, uh, the first ever annual conference I attended, um, there was a debate session over some pointless bill that I don't remember anymore, as we want to do in these sorts of things. And uh, someone saunters on up there, and the bishop goes, now this is a question, right? They go, yes, yes. And they start speaking. I just want to ask the people who are in support of this how they could possibly. And so the bishop uh, had, had to cut this uh, beloved child of God off. So friends, um, do uh, ask questions, right? Ask whatever is on your heart and on your mind and um, hand it to either me or Bridget. Uh, we will screen these, right? So if it ends in an exclamation point or it feels like it ends in an exclamation point, it might not get asked. Uh, there is no offense intended to this. We're just trying to be kind and gracious and generous. And um, uh, with that being said, um, I will open us up with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together uh, from multiple towns, from uh, multiple backgrounds, and with uh, a variety of hearts and minds, approaching this issue, this big, big issue. God, we just ask that your will would be done in this place, in this church, in our hearts, in our minds, that God, you would give us all exactly what we need as Christians, as Methodists, and as your children. Lord, may the words of all of our mouths, may the thoughts of all of our hearts glorify your name and be edifying to your church and your world and your kingdom. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, I appreciate you giving me this opportunity to come and share with you. For those of you who don't know, um, I called this home 42 years ago. Um, that was when our, our family moved away, and as I was standing in here a little while ago, I was thinking, you know, I used to sit in that pew when I was an acolyte. Um, it's at this altar that I ever got to serve communion in my life. Um, this church gave me my very first paying job. Um, I was the Sunday custodian, which meant I got on my bike, I rode to the church, I unlocked it, and turned the air conditioner or heat on, and... It was a regular paying gig, and I loved it. Um, but um, the reason this was home is because my dad was a Methodist pastor. I am a third-generation Methodist pastor. My oldest son is a fourth-generation Methodist pastor. Now, the reason that I'm, I'm telling you that is, one, to make it clear, I am Methodist to the core. I am Wesleyan to the core. That the Wesleyan theology, um, I am all about it. All right? Now, my grandfather was ordained in the Methodist Episcopal Church South. He retired from the Methodist Church. My dad was ordained in the Methodist Church. He died while he was a United Methodist pastor. I was, I am an ordained United Methodist pastor. In a few months, I will become a global Methodist pastor. 
And my oldest son has been dragging his feet on uh, his education because he was wanting to wait so he could be ordained in the Global Methodist Church. So that's, that's kind of a real interesting context to think four generations, four denominations. This ain't new, folks. <laughs> now, it's come about for different reasons, and I'll grant you, but um, we have always been Methodists just expressing in this developing way. Um, I am Methodist not because of my family heritage. I am Methodist because of the heritage of our, our Wesleyan theology, and I have had to make the decision to change from United Methodist to Global Methodist because I feel like it's the best way for me to hang on to that Wesleyan heritage. Now, for a lot of you, this whole discussion is kind of new information. Um, I can say I know the, the story from the inside on both sides. Um, I'm living in this kind of dual nature as a United Methodist and a Global Methodist because, um, you know, this has been my life, most of it. Actually, I, when I was born, it was just the Methodist Church. But um, I've always been a United Methodist pastor. But things have changed over my lifetime. And that's why, why I'm here. Now, we've been dealing with this, this contention for a long time. And you may be wondering, well, if it's been going on so long, why are we just now discussing it? Well, the fact of the matter is uh, we've been discussing it, but we've tried to shelter congregations from it. Uh, pastors don't like to talk about it because, one, it's kind of embarrassing, and nobody likes to talk about the family's dirty laundry. Um, the other thing is we have been very fortunate to have bishops who haven't allowed any variation from the book of discipline. And that has, has sheltered the churches in our conference. And so we should at least uh, thank God for that. Now, I was an alternate delegate to the 2016 General Conference. We gathered in Portland. You probably don't know it, but there was actually a deal negotiated a backroom deal, granted, but a deal was negotiated for the church to split at that conference. However, one of the negotiators manipulatively um, announced what was going on and torpedoed the whole thing. At General Conference, when we were in session, um, through some manipulations of the bishops, um, it was, a resolution was passed to have a special call session of the General Conference at some point before our next General Conference. It was to be the conference that would settle our issues once and for all and we would be done with it. Um, later in 2016, while we were electing new bishops and we were in Kansas City at that point, um, because I... I was a, a jurisdictional delegate. Um, we, we were having trouble getting our bishops elected in our jurisdiction. Um, because of that, we got news that uh, Bishop Oliveto was elected in the Western jurisdiction, um, which we, it was very, very well known that um, she was in a, um, she was a lesbian, had a partner, she was elected. Uh, we, because we were still in session, we were allowed to, to ask for a ruling of law about her, her election. It took a while, but the Judicial Council did rule that was out of order, but they also said they couldn't do anything about it because our look at this one didn't have any corrective measure if the College of Bishops for that jurisdiction didn't want to do anything. So, um, we had the call session of General Conference in St. Louis. Um, again, I was there. Um, yet again, 
we upheld the language of that has been in the Book of Discipline. It was called the traditional plan at that general conference. The traditional plan wasn't even going to be an option um, going into that general conference until that word got out and it, it raised enough of an uproar. But that that became the agreed upon, voted yet again. However, during that same session, those who didn't win the vote um, on the floor of the annual conference, they said, well, they would allow no further business to be conducted. Um, they would use every stall tactic they could come up with in order to make sure nothing else happened at that general conference. So the, the venom and the, the vitriol wasn't restrained at all. And I will tell you, that was my breaking point. Because I watched that and I thought, there is no way through this. There's only a way out of it. On January 3rd, 2020, because at that point we thought we were having a general conference in 2020, um, a, a protocol for reconciliation and grace through separation was agreed upon, acknowledging irreconcilable differences. Um, and it was, it had involved people from all across the spectrum in the, the Methodist church. The plan was to be approved that May and we would go on with life. Um, a little thing happened in 2020 that prevented us from, from gathering. Um, in the meantime, the Wesleyan Covenant Association, which is a, was established long before that, um, I'm a charter member of it. It was to be support for pastors who were in conferences where they really felt all alone. Because if you are a traditional pastor in the CalPAC conference, which incidentally, that's where I went through my candidacy because I was, uh, in my former life, I was an engineer and I worked out there. Um, if you're traditional out there, it's a very, very lonely existence. Um, in fact, when I went before the, the district committee to get approval for my candidacy, um, they, they heard my plans because I was gonna come back to Texas go to seminary, they said that's probably a good idea because you need to be exposed to broader perspectives on theology. Um, got even with them, I became far more conservative than they ever, they ever thought I'd be. Um, but um, with the impending division in the church, the WCA got to work because we had been told by Episcopalian, Presbyterians, Lutherans, denominations who had gone before us, don't wait. Have something in place. If you don't need it, nothing is lost. If you do need it, you're not caught unprepared, flat-footed. So we began to um, put together the Global Methodist Church. We started meeting. I've been a part of every legislative assembly of the Global Methodist Church. Uh, so people who say there's, there's still a ton of questions, not as many as you would think because this has been a work for years and there have been thousands of people involved in it. Um, but the Global Methodist Church launched officially earlier this year in, on May 1st because we felt like we didn't have any choice because general conference kept getting bumped, kept getting bumped, kept getting bumped. And so um, we just thought we can't wait any longer because we had congregations just ready to bolt. Now I know um, one of the questions people ask because the data we have is that the United Methodist Church is a traditional denomination. Um, 
just before uh, the 2019 special session of the general conference, a report was issued that actually surveyed and found that the biggest um, slice of the, the United Methodist Church is traditional. It wasn't quite 50%, but those who felt like they were uh, more in the center, they tended to lean more traditional. So people ask, well, if that's the case, why is it that it's the traditionalists that are leaving? Um, one, I will tell you, we're just tired of fighting. It's ridiculous. There comes a point where you just have to say enough is enough. Um, two, I will say, it's because it's a gift of God. Because we get to start new, we don't have to undo the book of this one. We get to get a new one. <laughs> and right now we've got two because we've got a transitional book of doctrines and discipline. We've got a one that's going to be that is prepared to be presented to the, the convening conference, um, which will probably be uh, we were hoping the end of 2023, but it may be the spring of 2024. Um, that's a work in progress. Um, so we don't have to dismantle the, the monstrosity. So that's that is a huge advantage. In fact, the transitional book of doctrine and discipline, you can see it online. It's about 100 pages long. That's a fraction of our book of discipline. Um, now, when you talk about what, what the issues are, there's lots of them. And I'm going to break them down into four general categories. Some, one category may be the big one for you. And then you may choose one or two others to, to really weight it, but um, the, the four areas that I would say you could focus on are doctrine, accountability, finances, and then the human sexuality. It's not one issue. This is, this is a, a, very, uh, a very big thing. Um, you will be told our doctrines and the United Methodist Church will not change. I will say, technically, that is absolutely true. Because according to the restrictive rules of the Book of Discipline, it's really, really, really hard to change doctrines. But it is really, really, really easy to ignore them. And if you have standard doctrines but no accountability, those doctrines really aren't standards at all. And that's where we, we find them, find ourselves. Um, another thing you hear is this promise of a big tent that will make room for all theological leanings, which sounds very warm and welcoming, uh, but it's already not true. Recently, we had a congregation in our conference that has voted and made it known that no one can be in leadership positions in their church if they are not fully supportive of the LGBTQAI plus um, lifestyle. There's just, there's no place for them. Not, not the biggest tent there. Which is what they're really saying is, if you want to hold to what the book of this one says of the United Methodist Church, you can't be a leader in this United Methodist Church. Um, there's a pastor in our uh, annual conference who served as a missionary in the Ukraine. He, he served under a uh, district superintendent there who was effective, um, had a real heart for for the people and love Jesus and the United Methodist Church. He had to come to America because uh, he needed some special care for one of his children who was autistic. They were out in California. He went to talk to a, a, a district superintendent there to say, you know, how can I, how can I serve? Him? Well, the one question he was asked was what his perspective was on human sexuality. And when he said he was supportive of what the book of discipline said, she 
told them, well, there's no place for you here. Um, that's not that's not a big tent. Um, in the West Ohio Conference, um, one of the key who calls himself a centrist leader um, was talking about his vision for the, the church. He said that it was his desire to block any graduate from Asbury Theological Seminary. Asbury Theological Seminary is a very traditional, um, theologically traditional conservative seminary in Kentucky. Um, produces far more Methodist preachers than any United Methodist Seminary. It's not officially a United Methodist Seminary. Um, but he wanted to block any graduates from there, and they are already operating that way. Um, again, somebody who came to our conference because there was no room for them there. Um, in fact, he he was in the ordination process, sent in his paperwork, uh, showed up for his district interview, was told they'd never received his paperwork. Um, he found that really interesting since he sent it by certified mail and he pulled out the receipt with the district superintendent's signature. Um, thank Jesus, miraculously, the paperwork showed up immediately. Uh, so, uh, at the uh, 2019 General Conference, one of the things that was said by another uh, this leader, um, Tom Berlin, he essentially um, called the traditional plan a virus in the church and uh, called those of us who supported it, compared us to the Ebola virus. He's now in the running to be a bishop out of Virginia. Now, my question in all the doctrine issues is, is there any such thing as heresy in the United Methodist Church? And the answer is apparently not. I mean, we haven't really hold, held anybody, we haven't even tried to hold anybody accountable since 1903. And at that trial, the charges were dismissed, and that's essentially why we've never had one since. However, um, back in May of 2021, um, the United Methodist pastor, Roger Wosley, wrote an article that denied the divinity of Christ. Um, several of our schools of theology um, promote Unitarian Universalism, which, again, is a very post-Christian view and denies the divinity of Christ and believes in universal salvation. Um, there's a list of those. Uh, there's a couple of our seminaries that are even um, very proud to say that they're, they have students who are pagan and neo-pagans. So, um, some of our boards board a ministry will not accept anybody who has a um, traditional understanding of Christian beliefs. There's no way to, to get past it. Um, in 2017, Bishop Oliveto preached that we ought not to create an idol out of Jesus because like you and me, he didn't have his life figured out. We might think of him as the rock of ages, but he was more like a hunk of clay forming and reforming himself in relation to God. Um, there's a, an associate pastor in our conference. The reason he's in our conference is he couldn't get through the process. Um, this again is out in Calpac, and he was told very early on, there's no place for you here. Um, at a, a, uh, a general conference in 2016, a pastor from Iowa, was asked how um, he could ignore the Bible's teachings, and he replied that the Bible wasn't a final authority about anything. Um, I've got other examples, but I think you're starting to get the, the gist of this. Um, 
it all, a foundational issue here is what is the authority of Scripture? One of the, the leaders of uh, State UMC and calls himself a centrist, but is Adam Hamilton. Adam Hamilton has taught that when you open your Bible, when you read a passage, you have to think about it and try to figure out which of three buckets this passage of Scripture goes in. Because some of the Bible is the Word of God meant for all people for all time. Some of it is meant for some people at one time. And some of it was never meant for anybody anywhere. And you have to decide. You have to decide. Scripture has authority over the church. The church doesn't have authority over scripture. In, in my theological um, roots, you're told that nothing is going to change. That is not true. The math tells you that. Because we have so many of the, the traditionalists who are pulling out either formally through the, this disaffiliation process or just walking away. There is nothing to restrain a, a more um, progressive agenda. Um, the Board of Church and Society, way back in uh, anticipating the 2020 General Conference, they already had a rewrite of our social principles that were a major move um, into a much more uh, progressive understanding. While technically the social principles aren't doctrine, um, they guide the ethics of the church. And in that sense, they are practical doctrine. Um, Jude tells us that we are to contend for the faith upholding the tradition that has been passed down to us through the ages. When that word tradition shows up, it doesn't mean our traditions. What it means is the fundamental teachings of the people of God, the followers of Jesus Christ that have been handed down generation to generation. That's what the word means there. And that's a set of beliefs that are unchangeable. And I love tradition because what that means is time-tested. And the older I get, the more I appreciate it. Um, but look, truth is not a personal choice. There is no your truth, my truth. There's your opinion, my opinion. But for me, truth is truth. Likewise, when we de develop our theology, it's not an issue of personal preference. It's about seeking the truth as God guides us based on the authority of Scripture. So that, that's that category of doctrine. Now, accountability is one of the big incendiary issues because it has been so prominent. There has been disregard for the Book of Discipline, outright disobedience, it's led to disorder. Um, we have bishops and pastors breaking their covenant of vows. Um, in 2016, there's a whole list of conferences that have made the made it a resolution. And even if the bishop rules it out of order, it is still practiced that um, that they will not obey the Book of Discipline, um, regardless of what it says about human sexuality. Um, just 2016 was a banner year for, for that to come out. Um, in last year, 2021, um, the North Central jurisdiction vowed to fight against the Book of Discipline. We will not restrict God's calling based solely on a candidate's sexual orientation or gender identity. 
We commit to doing good by pursuing healing and reconciliation with all who have experienced harm and exclusion related to sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, we have had numerous pastors perform uh, same gender weddings despite the fact that it is prohibited. Um, in June of this year, Oakland United Methodist Church in Dallas um, officially recognized as pastors, two openly gay pastors. Um, so they didn't even go through the ordination process, but they are, are being treated that way. Um, in Africa, we have bishops who are even going rogue there. Um, they are going to, to the extreme, um, dismissing general conference delegates who have been duly elected, um, removing pastors without any fair process, and even excommunicating pastors. There's no such thing in the United Methodist Church, and yet it's being done. And the problem is, there's, they're not being held accountable. And this is the, the times when bishops say, well, we can't do anything. <clears throat> they selectively find weakness. Um, now, why would, uh, why would African bishops act so inappropriately? I can't say for sure. Um, I do know that when it comes to their pay, they all receive salaries of $86,299, which is 13.3 times as large as the average salary in Nigeria, 34 times in Zimbabwe, 55.9 times in Liberia, and 111.7 <coughs> times in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and that's not even including the benefits, by the way. That would be housing and office payments and travel expenses. Um, earlier this year, the General Commission, I mean the Commission on General Conference, they delayed General Conference once again, which effectively cancels General Conference from 2020. Um, they use COVID as the excuse. Um, so we didn't meet as scheduled in 2020, obviously. Uh, they said we couldn't have a virtual general conference because there was no allowance made for that in the Book of Discipline. However, do you want to know how they came to that decision? It was in a virtual meeting. Uh, they have kept this delay tactic going. Um, their excuse this year was, well, our African delegates, because of of the aftermath of COVID, they would have so much trouble getting visas, there's just not enough lead time, we can't make it happen, and because we love our African brothers and sisters so much, we think we should delay it so we can actually come together face to face. The African delegates did not say that. We had a global legislative assembly of the, the GMC in May in Indianapolis. Every one of our African delegates were there. Asked them how long it took to get visas? 18 days. Now, I will tell you, I asked our bishop if at annual conference this year I could ask for a ruling of law about that commission. Because were they derelict in their duties because they didn't provide for general conference? And secondly, that they met improperly because they met in closed session. In the United Methodist Church, you cannot meet in closed session except in very narrow circumstances. Well, they claim because they're talking about contracts and um, those matters, well, these needed to be closed sessions. Well. They only talk about, and if you're not even going to meet, you're not talking contracts. So, um, you know, I, so I wonder, is it, or have they been meeting all these times improperly because nobody gets to hear their deliberations? Well, the bishop responded and explained that an annual conference can't ask for a ruling of law about a general conference commission. 
So it's so I told the bishop in response because I found that mind boggling. Um, so I told him how messed up we are that we have to have general conference to hold accountable the people who refuse to have general conference. That's the Gordian knot that we have tied with our, our book of this one. Now, I know I offer a lot of examples, and again, you are going to hear, well, that's an outlier. That's an outlier. That's an outlier. I have to ask, how many outliers do you have to pile up before they're no longer outliers? Or to think of it another way, if those are all outliers, then that means we have lost the center in the United Methodist Church. So you can hear my uh, frustration because we don't have accountability structures. So that's that category. Now, um, human sexuality. A lot of people have made this the focal point of, of why we are, are divided. It's a component it's not the full reality. Um, from where I come from, you know, it's the doctrine issues that's my big deal. Uh, but this has been a disagreement that has been going on since 1972. There have been constant attempts to change our theology regarding human sexuality. And general conference after general conference after general conference has maintained the, the consistent language. Um, we've come to this place where our theology and polity no longer matter. Uh, and I will also tell you, back to that, we're not going to change. We already are changing. Because on our year-end reports um, that are, each church has to complete, there's gender fluid category of non-binary to account for members. So you got male, female, non-binary. Um, another thing that pops into my head um, when you're while we're on this topic, people love to say, "But what if we're wrong?" like we were wrong about slavery. It's a terrible argument. We weren't wrong about slavery. When the Methodist Episcopal Church was established in this country, it was anti-slavery. It was when certain conferences wanted to rewrite the Book of Doctrine and Discipline, rewrite what was official, have their own version, that was when we started to pull apart as a denomination. It's not comparable. So let's be really clear on that. I have to say, though, when, when I look at this, um, in my reading of Scripture, whenever God's people begin to reflect the culture around them, it never goes well for God's people. If we are like the culture around us, we have nothing to offer. If we are, are like the, the culture around us, we actually have less influence on the culture around us. It's our distinctiveness that, that is our power. And that goes back to the, the early days of Christianity because the early Christians were considered pretty strange. It's time for us to be comfortable being strange. Um, the final area has to do with finances. Um, we pay a lot of money in apportionments. Um, they're meant to promote the ministry of the United Methodist Church. I would contend that they primarily promote the bureaucracy of the United Methodist Church um, because we are super top-heavy. Years ago, um, I'm... I'm pretty nerdy. Um, I read a lot, and I, I like to read a variety of things. But years ago, this has probably been 25, 30 years since I read it, uh, Peter Block's book, Stewardship. It's a business book. 
But in, in stewardship, he talks about how the leaders in a business organization, they are stewards. They are there to, to promote the mission of this, this business. Therefore, when you look at, let's take a factory as an example, who are the most important people in a factory? They're the ones who are assembling the widgets, right? Because they're actually producing what you're there to produce. Everybody else in that whole factory is there to support them. Now, the reason I bring that up is when we talk about the structure of the United Methodist Church, our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Therefore, everything that is this support structure we have should be helping you become disciples and make disciples. I have challenged people in the pews. Can you tell me five things that the, the conference does for you to make you a disciple or equip you to be a disciple? And I'll spot you two. They send you a pastor and they hold camp. I think we're, we're missing something here. Um, another issue that is big in this whole discussion is the trust clause. From the beginning, John Wesley included a trust clause on all Methodist property. So that if it ever ceased to be Methodist, then the property would revert back to the, the local annual conference. He put it in place in order to maintain doctrinal integrity. Uh, we have clung to it, and now I'm not sure that's why it's there. You, you look at our local churches. You are the one who have been sacrificial. You are the ones who have built and maintained. Uh, you've made the the um, the church possible in your community, but you don't exactly own it. Um, when it comes to disaffiliation, we're fortunate in our conference because we are sticking strictly to paragraph 25 and P3, which says that financially, all that we are required to pay is two years apportionments, 100% last year's apportionments, 100% of this year's apportionments. That's it. In other annual conferences, because of the trust clause, they are requiring churches to pay 25% or even 50% of their total assets, which is impossible in some settings. Uh, think about that property out in California. There is not a church who could afford that to pay even half. And by the way, your churches would be considered pretty good sized churches out in Southern California. Um, so, um, the reason that we're having this discussion now is twofold. And with a certain sense of urgency. One, we have had a bishop who has been very meticulous in upholding the Book of Discipline. Um, he's been very um, cooperative in this whole disaffiliation process, but he's retiring at the end of the year, and there are no guarantees after that. The other thing is that on paragraph 2553, which was passed at the 2019 General Conference to allow disaffiliation, um, there had been another paragraph in there that we'd been using for 70 years, but just last month the Judicial Council said that was unconstitutional after 70 years. Um, so that's not an option, but 2553 still is. The problem is it has a sunset clause. At the end of 2023, it goes away completely. And there are no guarantees that, that there will be another means provided. So for me, it's kind of a now or never opportunity. So let's talk about that's why I have chosen get out of the United Methodist Church, but let me 
tell you why I want to get into, and I am into the, the Global Methodist Church. We are not in the Global Methodist Church going to be Methodism 2.0. Um, we're committed to holding on to our distinctive Wesleyan DNA that made the Methodist a movement. Um, our mission is really clear. To make disciples of Jesus Christ who worship passionately, love extravagantly, and witness boldly. Um, so let me tell you, I want to be a part of a church that holds to an Orthodox Wesleyan theology grounded in scriptural authority. Um, the GMC will proclaim what the church has proclaimed consistently for 2,000 years, and it is going to be grounded in the Bible as summarized in the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and the definition of Chalcedon, the, and the and Wesley's Articles of Religion and the Confessions of Faith. Now, it may surprise you that our Confessions, the Nicene and Apostles' Creeds, have no standing in the United Methodist Church. They're in our, our um, hymnals, but they have no doctrinal authority. We tried to pass a resolution in 2016 to include the um, the uh, Apostles' Creed as part of our doctrine, but that was that was defeated. Um, so, at the base of all of our doctrines is this authority of Scripture. We can't get beyond that. We can't get away from that. Um, one of the things I'm excited about in regard to this, we have already have developed a catechism. I don't know if y'all know what a catechism is. It comes out of more of a Catholic um, Lutheran tradition, but it's a series of questions and answers. The reason it's laid out as, as questions and answers is because it's made it's intended to be more memorable. Because you, this was catechisms came about before most people were literate, and so you would just get it through the repetition. Uh, there are some pastors that I've talked to who are already leading their churches through the catechism, and they said they have said their people love it because while they're simple questions with simple answers, they lead to some really deep discussions. But what we want to make clear is there are some, some basic doctrines that we will not compromise on. Um, I want to be a part of a church that is missionally driven, not structurally bound, um, the early Methodists were organized. In fact, I remember reading a book in seminary called Organized to Beat the Devil. Um, it was about the, the early Methodists. But their organization had the purpose of reaching the lost with the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, we are, have become a bureaucracy committed to, to supporting the institution. Um, I, I told you we have prepared two different books of doctrines and discipline. Notice it's not a book of discipline, it's a book of doctrine and discipline. The earliest Methodists had a book of doctrine and discipline because it is our understanding that, that doctrines have to come first. And the discipline flows, flows out of that. I'm an engineer by training way back um, that's why I'm wearing an A&M shirt. Um, <laughs> but the, in engineering, you know, we're taught form follows function. Let's be really clear about that. Um, this is this is no small thing. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you my. Epiphany moment in our legislative assemblies. One of them, the biggest agenda item was we had to go through a series of subcommittee reports. How many of you have ever gotten excited about a subcommittee report of any kind, anywhere? 
Well, that was kind of the way I was going into it because I had my expectations and they were low. As we were sitting there, um, we started listening. And I turned, Jim Bass was sitting next to me. He's a, another pastor in our conference. I turned to him, dude, we could teach this stuff. I had never had something, I would never seen a committee report that excited me for ministry. It was such a weird experience. And I thought, okay, Jesus has to be at work here, if that's the case. And so I got, I got really that excited because they were that good. Um, I want to be a part of a church that embraces accountable discipleship that brings genuine transformation. We want to bring back class meetings. And class meetings aren't Sunday school classes. Class meetings are gather, small group gatherings, typically about 12 people. Who ask each other, how is it with your soul? And it's what the question is really asking is, where do you see God working in your life this week? Let's share that. And it feeds each other and it holds you accountable. So you start to look around and, and you start to become more aware. Now, there are also these smaller gatherings called bands. That's three to five people. I'm a part of a band with some other pastors. We get together once a week by Zoom, and we have a series of questions we ask each other, and then we get together once a month. And we meet on a Sunday night just to hang out and share life with each other, and then Monday morning we sit down together in the same room and go through those questions. And we ask them, you know, where do you see God working? How is God speaking to you through the Spirit and through Scripture? And the last question we ask you, and it, we also ask, what sin have you committed? The last question, what secrets are you trying to hide? You know what? That has been life-giving to us. We have wondered, how did we survive all these years without doing this? Because it has been that nurturing, that life-giving. Um, you know, we've got a, a connection like no other. Because we can have those kinds of discussions and we can trust each other enough. And we've, we've all had our struggles. And we've been there for each other. I want to be a part of a church that understands... The Holy Spirit makes disciples of Jesus Christ through the local church. Um, we, we are much more aware that it is the local church that is the front line of ministry. You are the ones who make ministry happen. Um, in the GMC, everything that, that we are putting in place, we don't want to weigh down local congregations. We want to set local congregations free. Um, that's part of the reason we're not going to require a trust clause at all. I mean, if you don't like us, uh, we want to be a denomination of the willing, not the constrained. So you can call a church vote and you're done with us. Um, but we want you to feel that freedom um, that freedom to share Jesus with your community and reach out around the world. I'm convinced that, that that's part of the power is we're actually going to be more aware of our global reach. And that's, that's why I want to be a part of a church that is a global movement. We are already a global denomination. Um, the first annual conference to join the Global Methodist Church was the Bulgarian Annual Conference. Um, we have churches and annual conferences in Eastern Europe, South Korea, the Philippines, and Africa, all beginning the process of joining the, the GMC. Um, and we are going to be aligned with our, theologically aligned with our brothers and sisters all around the world. Now that's one of the ironies about what the, what 
one of the big proposals is for the future of the United Methodist Church. They actually want to split the church. Um, we get accused of splitting it, but they want to split it. It's just they want to break it down into regional bodies so that you can have variations on your theology based on your context. Which, you know, I want, I want to stand with all my brothers and sisters. And thank God for our African delegates because they are the ones who have, have at least kept us in the ballpark for several general conferences. And so, you know, I want to be partnered with folks from around the world. Um, I want to be a part of a church that allows spirit-led giving rather than bureaucratic demanded funding. Um, there are no top-down apportionments in the GMC. We will have connectional giving, but it will not exceed one and a half percent for the general church and 5% for annual conferences. And we're not going to tell you what that number is. You're going to tell us what that number is. The local church treasurer will calculate that with a formula you will understand. Which, by the way, I will tell you, our apportionments for our conference, um, I don't know if you know how they're calculated. None of us do. Um, the formula we use has nothing to do with membership, uh, for our conference, it was literally developed by an Aggie economist, and it is inexplicable um, because it builds in these factors about ability to give in the local church and um, economic factors, and you're going to figure this out because it's going to be the percentage based on operating income from the previous year, excluding capital and debt service, memorials, missions, fundraisers, church contributions to claim a pension and health benefits. And for those churches who struggle because of having to come up with some money to disaffiliate, they will waive the, the requirements for, for this giving um, for the first few years. Because we want local churches to be resourced so you can carry out ministry because you've got to take it personally. Um, I want to be a part of a church that is committed to multiplication. That means disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Churches that plant churches that plant churches. It is the goal of the Global Methodist Church to plant 3,500 congregations in the first 77, 3,500 congregations in the first seven years. That includes a lot of different kinds of expressions, including house churches and, and on from there. At the same time, we want to revitalize local churches. We've already come to an agreement with Asbury Theological Seminary, uh, entered into a partnership to grow a multi-million dollar fund to make grants for church planting. Um, we have also entered into a strategic multiplication alliance with the River Network, which is a, a team composed of church multiplication specialists uh, from various churches in the, the Wesleyan theological family in order to make this multiplication possible. Um, I want to be a part of a church that sees bishops as spiritual leaders and guardians of the faith instead of watchdogs of the institution. Um, following Wesley's understanding of the New Testament, bishops and elders are of the same order. We say that now, but that's not the way it's practiced because when you're elected bishop, you're elected a bishop for life. In the GMC, bishops will be elected to six-year terms, maximum 12 years. Um, there won't be any jurisdictions. They'll be elected by the general church. Um, bishops may be reelected, but once they're done, if they want to keep serving, they go back into the local church. There, this isn't for life. Um, and I want to be a part of a church where the ordination process is simple and fair. And that's going to begin here at, at the local church. Um, you're going to be playing a primary role in vetting pastors. We also will have slightly different um, 
educational requirements because we live in an age where where people are coming into this they have uh, different life situations um, getting a master's of divinity which is what is generally required at the united methodist church my mdiv if i remember correctly it was 86 hours of graduate work it would have been easier to get a law degree so um, we have some some alternatives on that we also um, are going to be providing course of study options so there there will be something that will fit different lifestyles because we also realize in the future we may see a lot more um, tent maker ministers and by that i mean they will have a full-time job plus a, a ministry job so that will probably get to be more common that's that's actually what my son is doing right now he works at a hospital <laughs> he's going to seminary online and he pastors a church so blessed are the young with their energy um you one last thing is I, I want to be a part of a church where the local church has a voice in their clergy appointments. That is the design of the Global Methodist Church. Um, you will be a part of a discussion. Now, the bishop will make the actual appointment. We're doing that because we want to hold congregations accountable to make sure that we um, provide for women and we provide for for minority individuals people of color uh, we don't want them to be discriminated against and so we do want to uh, be accountable for that but we're going to have this hybrid call appointment system appointment means the bishop tells you where you serve a call system says the church goes out and does a, a search so we're going to do a little bit of both. You will have multiple candidates you'll be able to talk to. Um, you'll give, you'll have discussion with them. You'll give your input in the conversation and the appointment will be made. Also, there will be no guaranteed appointments in the Global Methodist Church. Right now, um, we've got a really good union if you're a United Methodist pastor. Because as long as you're a pastor, you got a job. We have to find an appointment for you. You can't lose. Well, clergy effectiveness is going to be based on fruitfulness. And that will be the local church will have, have the, the voice in that. So to sum all of that up, I want to be a part of a vibrant church that is unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That doesn't apologize, doesn't feel the need to apologize for those who have gone off the rails. I want to be a part of a church that is committed to bringing about the gospel of Jesus, getting it out to the people who haven't heard the good news yet. We are, we, as John Wesley said, we have nothing to do but save souls. That's what I want to be about. All right. That is my whole pitch right there. Um, so, questions, questions, questions. I'll do my best to answer them. <clears throat> we have several. I'll kind of group them into a few buckets. We have a, a few here first um, about accountability, which you touched up on, uh, or retouched up on, or elaborated all. Um, will will clergy and bishops be disciplined for not following the the book of discipline um, for the GMC? Absolutely. I mean that is foundation. We are going to be huge on accountability um, and that covers oh okay this one i haven't seen before it's fun um, will gmc congregations be able to excommunicate its members as a measure of discipline um, <laughs> no. that's a funny way of putting it um, we, we will, I will say, we are expecting churches to hold members accountable. Um, some local churches, I will tell you, some local churches, as part of who they are, are have already said in the, the GMC, a part of our DNA as a congregation is, we want membership vows to be a yearly thing. 
not just once you're on the roll. I mean, you know, that the old sort of Methodist Baptist thing, once on the roll, always on the roll. Um, once saved, always saved sort of thing. But, but each year you have to re-up, you know? And, you know, you may have mixed feelings about that, but it ain't all bad. Uh, John Wesley had some pretty stout standards. If you didn't participate in your class meeting, in some situations, good luck getting Holy Communion. So, uh, the, I won't say excommunicate, I will just say there will be accountability. All right? I think these are more uh, structural, connectional kinds of questions. <clears throat> All right. And let me tell you, um, if I have to think, I'm trying to keep three different books of this one in my head right now. So, that would be two too many. Um, oh, how are we organized districts, conferences? We will have no jurisdictions. There's just going to be the, the Global Methodist Church. We will have annual conferences. In fact, this area will be part of the Eastern Texas Annual Conference. We are forming it right now. We already have our, our website and our Facebook page, so we must be real. Um, but we're getting all of the, the structures into place in this transitional period. So we will have, have annual conferences. The conferences will be broken down into districts. The districts will be much different, however. Your district superintendent will be the pastor of a church, not somebody who just, that's all they do, is superintend a district, um, which I have no idea what that means, but they do something full-time. Um, but with this, they'll serve a church plus oversee some of the surrounding churches. So it'll be much smaller districts, and I think it'll be much closer relationships. Uh, we will have a general conference. Um, initially, we're going to have general conference every two years because we're getting up and running, so it's going to take a little extra effort. Um, that's just a, a reality of it, and then we'll go into a more reasonable sort of uh, um, cycle. Will there be a person in charge? Um, if you mean, will there be a Methodist Pope? Um, <laughs> no, but we will have bishops, and they, they will serve to, to oversee. Um, right now, actually, we do have a person in charge. Um, that would be Keith Boyette. He has, has been the, the president of the, the GMC. He, he actually was the um, original um, leader of the Wesleyan Covenant Association and now to get the GMC up and running. But um, that, is, that will shift once we convene. Um, how many churches in Texas are GMC? Um, I can't give you exact numbers because it's a moving target right now. I know that most of the Northwest Texas Conference has gone GMC. I know in Central Texas, I believe it's 80, because they already had their special session of annual conference. I believe 80 churches have completely disaffiliated now. In our conference, which this will, the, those who are voting this fall, it'll be approved finally December 3rd, with the official start date, January 1st. Um, right now, it's, again, it's a moving target. It's probably around 140 churches out of 600-ish churches in our conference. There are actually a little over half of the churches in our conference are in some part of the discernment process or have made their decision. Some of the churches that have decided to disaffiliate are, have just chosen to go independent. Um, some of our larger ones, but they're going into a discernment process to decide about denominational alliance, separate from the disaffiliation. So um, when we start trying to get numbers, it gets a little a little funky. But then we will have a, a substantial conference. Um, how will we get pastors from seminary who will follow the discipline of the GMC? Um, our process for um, our board of ordained ministry, um, we are 
going to be have very high expectations for the answers we get. Um, and there will also it will also be clear you will be accountable to the promises you made. And you will have to uphold our doctrines. If not, you need to find another denomination in order to um, to carry out your calling because it ain't with us. And that's not being mean. That's just uh, Jim Collins, another <laughs> another business guy, good to great. Um, you know, it's his thing of helping people find their seat on the bus. You gotta get on the right bus. So, um, you know, if your calling isn't with us, that doesn't mean you don't have it, but it's just not with, with the GMC. Um, what church? Oh, what church? You asked which church it was that um, made the decision about the um, leadership and the LGBT. UAI uh, lifestyle, that was uh, Strawbridge and Kingwood. So um, I don't know the exact verbiage because I'm, I'm not totally bad around. Um, which seminaries are teaching the, oh, there was no resurrection. Um, is it a theology to deconstruct or force to adopt? Um, what you would hear in seminaries um, is really a discussion, not so much of whether resurrection or not, but more of what, what does resurrection mean? Because there are those who would say, well, it was just a spiritual resurrection that um, the disciples perceived with Jesus. Um, the Bible says bodily resurrection with Jesus. Um, you just, I will tell you, in seminary, you get exposed to a lot of stuff um, that you have to filter through. Um, I was very blessed. I was a student pastor in, well, while I was in seminary. A local church is a great filter for what you're getting in the local church. Real quick story. The guy who followed me, um, he was telling me, he said, you know, um, I was praying because we got, he went to the same seminary I did at TCU, Bright Divinity School. And God language was a big thing. So he was using all of these references to God. You know, using the full spectrum of references to God. And he did that for a while and it finally dawned on him. Well, these people don't really care, I'm thinking. And so he asked them about it and he said, Why didn't y'all say something? They said, Oh, we knew you'd get over it. So <laughs> I said, Yeah, I must have prepared them well. Um, if a church decides to leave the UMC and decides the to join GMC, how long till a minister is appointed? Um, we will do that. We're in an interesting place on both sides of this. The the cabinet in our Texas annual conference is trying to get a grasp of what pastors are going to stay with the United Methodist Church, where, what church they're in, which, where it's going to go. On our side in the GMC in the Eastern Texas Annual Conference, we're trying to do the same thing because we've got to figure out what we've got to work with. So the, the reality is you won't have, I won't say no lag time because Honestly, on our side, we're building the train while we're rolling down the tracks a little bit. Um, we're trying to get it done this fall, but inevitably there's going to be things we go, oh yeah, we probably ought to do that. Um, so we, we don't anticipate a lot of lag time on that, but um, we will make sure your pulpit is covered. I can say that. <laughs> we will get someone here. So. Um, we, we will assure you of that. And besides, some of you might need to discern your calling to be preacher. So what a great opportunity.
You can test drive a few weeks. Um, will the GMC have enough pastors for all churches? Um, from everything we've seen, absolutely. Um, is human sexuality the only issue concerning the Methodist spirit, uh, Methodist split? Um, no, it's just, for some people, it is the issue. I mean, put a magnifying glass, that's all you see. Um, for most of the rest of us, it's just one dimension of it. For me, doctrine is number one. Accountability is number two. Um, human sexuality, I guess if it's an outflow of doctrine, it may be up there. But, but for me, it really is the, the more fundamental doctrinal issues that are at stake here. Um, so there's a lot that's, that's going on. So... Uh, how will the um, split affect? Oh, how will the split affect mission work? Actually, I am convinced it's going to set mission work on fire. Right now, we kind of get to. Um, insulate ourselves or distance ourselves from mission work because we say, oh, we pay apportionments. And some of that, I'm pretty sure, goes to mission somehow. I'm not sure how much, but some of it I'm sure does. What we want to see is local churches make connections with missions around the world. In January of 2020, I went on a mission, a teaching mission trip to Tanzania. And we taught... Um, in local churches and the pastors in that area um, I loved it and I will tell you I have a heart for the work in Tanzania because of that because I've, I've shared with them and we were really wanting to get some of, some of the pastors to come to the U.S. to be able to talk about their ministries but you know something happened in 2020 um, but but it's that, that personal connection that actually stokes the fire so you feel a real connectedness to what's happening around the world. We want everybody to experience that. It doesn't mean you have to go. Well, missionaries are used to, to coming to churches to, to talk and to share. Um, I've got some nephews who are missionaries. They and their, their families are missionaries. Um, they come back regularly because they need to go out and share their message and tell people about the mission. And because people people give generously to people. It's not just here's an organization. That doesn't that doesn't make your heart fire. That doesn't set you on fire. So we actually think it's going to, to strengthen our reach around the world. Uh, will pensions and retirements be affected? Um, sort of. <laughs> we're, we're going to, our pensions as clergy are going to stay within West Path, which is where it's always been. Um, we are going to, in a portion of our pension, I don't want to describe the whole pension system, but in a portion of it that's being moved over, they are going to do a 7% adjustment on it. And by adjustment, I mean take out 7%. But that's to make sure that all future pensions are whole on the United Methodist side. So it will have a little impact, but not, not really. Um, you know, when I talk about my pension in the stock market when it's gone way down, you know, I've never lost a dime because I never looked. Um, <laughs> life is better that way. I'm not going to need it for a while yet, um, although it's coming up soon. Um, what will the GMC do to bring youth and families into the church? And my answer is, you tell me what you're going to do to bring youth and families into the church, because it is the local church where ministry happens. There is nothing that we can do. There's no wand we can wave. We will try to equip you to do it as best you can. I'll be 
brutally honest with you right now, my congregation is trying to figure that out because we had a ministry going and COVID hit and we don't have a ministry going now. Um, our families either got completely out of the habit and quit coming or um, in a few cases they went to other churches that had bigger, better um, things going. So we are figuring that out and it's taking a mind shift because instead of saying simply, okay, how do we get the kids here? It's how do we get out there to where the kids are? What can we do to reach out to our community around us? That's a whole different way of thinking. And you ask a whole different set of questions. Um, as a member of GMC, will you still have flood buckets in case of disaster? Um, oh, can't get anyone at Uncore to answer. Um, I will say this is one of those things that we're in process, honestly. Um, I would have no issue of saying, well, keep working through Uncore because they are there. Um, but we're trying to evaluate uh, what to what to do. Um, typically, I would say, you know, we would we would love to support Uncore. However, there have been times when people who have helped Uncore out in the field and been told not to talk about Jesus, which you do know what business we're in, right? Um, so. Anyway, um, who gets the building if you leave? Can you buy the building? And the way that the disaffiliation is working, the property is all yours. Um, after the vote on December 3rd, you will get a bunch of official documents from the Texas Annual Conference that releases you from the trust clause, which means the property all goes to the local church. You're going to have some, there will be some legal work that you have to have done. Um, because you're gonna to have to clean up some deed wording and make some changes there. You got issues with bank accounts and on and on. Um, a lot of details, but you will get, um, you will have full ownership of your building. But like I said, that's not true in every conference. So just thank God you are where you are. Um, if our church votes to leave the UMC, what is the path toward GMC? Um, there is a resolution that you will pass that says we want to be GMC. There's actually some specific wording because part of that resolution is that you will promise to uphold the doctrines as found in part one and the social witness in part two. Um, you can go online to globalmethodist.org and look at the Transitional Book of Doctrines and Discipline, and um, you can read those first two sections if you would like. Um, but then from there, there's an application. We pastors who are making the transition are going to make application through the Texas Eastern Annual Conference, and um, it's, a, it's a smooth process. We just need the paperwork to uh, verify all this, the uh, proper resolutions have happened and it will include that vote in December. So it's not complicated, um, but we wouldn't be Methodists if there wasn't a form involved. So um, what is the time frame it takes to become GMC? Um, not long. <laughs> it will, if you follow the process, January 1st, you will be GMC. So it's, it's just we're, we are processing um, the paperwork in our Texas Eastern Annual Conference. Um, and we also have to vet the pastors who want to move over. Um, because pastors will also have to say, I'm going to uphold the, the doctrines and discipline of the Global Methodist Church. And just because you say you want to, doesn't mean you really want to, so we need to make sure. Um, Getting away from doctrine, what is the GMC's action plan for local churches dealing with 501c3 and removing our property from trust clause of UMC? Um, on the trust clause, like I said, that's going to happen. 
after December 3rd. That's uh, an action that the trustees of the Texas Annual Conference will provide. As for the 501c3, we're having this discussion over dinner. Um, the, the short answer is, um, according to, and this is an engineer turned pastor, has nothing to do with my um, insights on law. But based on the lawyers that the GMC has inquired through, um, all GMC churches will come under the GMC umbrella as a 501c3. The complication is that the IRS isn't taking applications for these distinct umbrella <laughs> groups. Um, however, according to the IRS code, because uh, I just looked it up uh, before this, paragraph 508, which sounds like such a goober thing to know, um, but the lawyers say based on that, um, all churches are covered and it will be sufficient to assume uh, 501c3 status under that. Now, you can you can disagree um, and consult your own lawyers. Um, that is possible. Uh, and, and by the way, um, for law, as you look at um, the requirements for um, legal issues, um, there is an organization, NCLL. I think it's over or com. It's a group of lawyers uh, who are working with churches that want to move into the GMC. You can become a member for $1,000 a year and they will take care of all of the paperwork that's going to be involved. You might be able to cut a better deal with someone, but they have made themselves available on that. That's not in lawyer terms, that ain't bad. Um, they have lawyers here in Texas who know all of the, the details so they can handle it just to make that uh, known to you. Um, if we got GMC and in a year one out, can we get out without a large fee? You can get out with no fee. Um, you'll go through a time of discernment, you'll take a congregational vote, and that's about all there is to it. We, we're not that complicated. Um, is Wesleyan theology only going to be present in the GMC? Um, if you mean is, are we going to be a clearly Wesleyan denomination? Absolutely. Um, and that, you know, it's because of our, I think Wesleyans have the most complete, comprehensive understanding of God's grace, including the call to a holy life and sanctification. That's why I'm a part of um, the GMC, because we want to, to really bring back that emphasis. As disciples of Christ, how will GMC approach our gay members? Um, we are going to be welcome. We are going to welcome everybody. You know what, we are in the transformation business. I don't know you that well, but here's what I know. You are all a bunch of stinking sinners. <laughs> and you need Jesus. And that includes the one at the microphone. That's the business we're in. And so we welcome everybody. We love everybody. Um, if we can't, if there is anybody who walks through those doors who doesn't feel your hospitality, your sin is greater than theirs. Because you know better. You're supposed to have love of Jesus in you. You're supposed to have the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. So yes, we are going to be, be welcome. Um, and it doesn't matter where they are in their, their walk, they have a place. And um, that being said, just like everybody else, Jesus has is, is sent us to, to transform you, to change you. We all want to become like Jesus. Right? All right, um, that's, that uses up all our cards. Um, you know, if you still got questions, I still got 
time later we'll dismiss, but I'll, I'll hang out if there are some that you just didn't get answered. Um, I will do my best to answer. Um, if you um, something pops in your head, um, you got my contact information, so <laughs> don't be shy. There's there's um, very very little that um, I haven't been asked, although there were a couple tonight for the first times. But um, anyway, I do appreciate it, and I I pray God's blessing on your time of discernment, trying to understand God's calling for your congregation in your community. Um, I pray that, that the Holy Spirit is going to guide every step of the way and through it all, love each other. Even if you don't agree, love each other. Embrace each other. Because if we can't do that, we're, we're, we got so much more work to do. And that's the important part. So, um, just just maintain that that um, that fellowship that has made you a part of your church for all of these years. Um, you know, you come to a time of discernment, and if you come to a time of vote, you're going to take that vote, whatever the outcome is, and you know what? You're going to get up the next morning, and you're still going to love each other. So that's that's all I got to say. I'll turn it back over to you. agenda so thank you so much for coming to speak with us tonight thank you all for coming to listen and for asking some good questions and uh let's say a quick word of prayer as we conclude lord we do thank you uh for being given some hard work because you have empowered us with your holy spirit and with all the grace of jesus christ to do this hard work to make disciples of jesus christ for the transformation of your world so we give you thanks, Lord, and we ask all the more for your Holy Spirit to be with us as we depart this place tonight and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.